Yes, yes, people, you are listening to Team Energy of the Energy Podcast. I am Troy Banks, T-R-O-Y-B-A-N-X-N, a.k.a. Mr. Goodness, here with student of life himself, Xavier Bawawaiba. Yes, sir. Boy, today's topic, you are what you eat. How do you see yourself? How did you see yourself? And how do you see yourself now? My topic. Yeah. Where to begin? Let's go back to childhood. How did you see yourself during childhood? When you got to the mirror, what age group? They say there's three stages of development. So there's four years old, nine years old, and then your early teens, and then I guess now. Uh, but I am as a man of four to nine years old. Uh, let's go with a. End of primary school, start secondary. So think about graduating or finishing primary school at the top of your year group or top of your school and then going into the big wide world that is secondary school. Or is it middle school in America? Hmm. I was thinking because first I went to primary school in Nigeria in Lagos. Man, I called Lagos Preparatory School. Yeah, and man, that was an experience, a very close-knit group of people I surrounded myself with, and my gen teachers were funny, you know, yeah, like, I didn't experience the cane or anything, but <laughs> they get angry, man, real quick, you know, like, like, quick, like that, yeah, to fire birds, it's like, Overall, I was very, I think I was very to myself in, in class and yeah man, and how did I see myself? Yeah man, I was like in my own little bubble in my own little world, you know when you're like, when you're younger as How it's described in adulthood is having that COVID and continuing to cover that inner child that you have. Because with that, children are very naive and intuitive beings who are just present, almost looking at the world and wonder. They don't have, their mind hasn't been, doesn't have impressions from like, all these different belief systems, I don't know how the world works yet. So yeah, I was just really just like at the center of my world, but almost like in my own little bubble. But yeah, I had a good, good group of friends as well, but eventually I'd go to the UK to do prep school. So that was a bit of a change for me. Would you say your identity was tied to your friends or were you very much your own person from my deal? Yeah, I think in the beginning it was very much tied to my friends because I remember changing when I went to UK. Went to a prep school called Oxhill, basically Newbury. Basically an all white school. One of my cousins ended up going there. Shout out Mira. <laughs> but yeah, fully, it was going from all that, a fully Nigerian school mixed to an all boys white school basically and that I was just like right this is a completely different culture change yeah so a lot of my identity was tied to my friend because I didn't feel like that sense of homesickness but you know when you're like 12 11 yeah and it was this new experience for me I remember my mom was crying <laughs> and the day she let me go she's like oh I went to the country first time Silent face, powerful. So, yeah. yeah. No sign of weakness. Yeah. It was a matter, it was a matter because I feel like I immersed myself in that new environment and make new friends. So, I got back, that's when I really had to get out of my comfort zone and start developing social skills on another level because these are like completely different people, a completely different way of life, a different culture. 
want to change. Okay. Yeah. I see. So, what was the spark that made you develop the skills? Was it trial by fire, or was, like did you actively had to survive? <laughs> <laughs> or it's just gonna be, or you're just gonna be like just chilling in yeah. complete solitude, you know? And school it's all about can't be in those friends. Mm. Having those meaningful relationships as you get as you get as you get older. So you developed you became more extroverted, would you say? Yeah, I definitely became more extroverted. At the UK school? Yeah, at the prep school and new grade. Yeah. Okay. Um yeah, I started yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah, that's all I was saying on that. Fair. What about physical characteristics? Like, did you change your look? Did you change your sense of style? Well, there was nah, nah, there was a uniform. Was a uniform. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was like, uh, yeah. Did you have a different tie? Uh, just like, yeah, it's it's tie it's like, like the yeah. From the head, like shame. You're just thinking like, oh, you just look at the cringe. Your face just cringes, and you think about the uniform you have to put on. Ah, uh, oh, stop it. <laughs> We had um, the deadest uniforms in the first Where did you go to school? So I went to school at Ravensbourne. Yeah. So I, I went to bring a little crown with it. So I was homeschooled for a little bit when yeah. I went up to America. Um, I stayed during primary school. I went to a couple of places like Portsdown. Um, stayed at Raglan Private School for like a week. Then I finally settled in Hayes, Hayes Private School school really enjoyed that experience mm -hmm. um then i ended up in secondary going to the Ravensbourne school mm -hmm. which was a slightly different change and yeah when i finally went to sixth form i went to hayes again and it was kind of the difference between primary school it's more so like you said you're like a black boy in a white crowd, especially growing up. Mm -hmm. When I moved away from where I was originally born, um, it was a like much blacker area, shall I say. So mm -hmm. we went to Garden Primary School, and Garden Primary School was like absolutely amazing. Went away to America, came back, went to Hayes, and it was a bit of a culture shock, but it was early on enough that you felt you could integrate and like. You felt that um, you were more so accepted, mm -hmm. like everyone was just a big group of friends, as within primary school. Um, yeah, got to Ravens form, and it was different. It was a lot more diverse in terms of culture, but also yeah. a lot more of a different experience, like going from almost being like a big fish in like a small pond to like being the new kid or being like the year sevens that are like have their backpacks that are bigger than mm. them. <laughs> I always remember that. <laughs> the ties like down to there, yeah. or, like the backpacks that are that are bigger than you. <laughs> Amazing. I remember that. But yeah, and then um, I finally got to sixth form and I kind of rekindled with some of my friends from Hayes. Mm -hmm. I went to that sixth form after, and then obviously got over to uni. But I'd say in primary school, I was very like confident, um, very like angry and impulsive kid. But where did you learn that confidence from, and where did the rage come from as well? Definitely, I think I developed the confidence from being in like Mitchum and being at Garden Primary. Feel like it was kind of mm -hmm. like iron sharpening iron, yeah. Like just through play, like what do they say? You learn through play, yeah. but not more than you can learn through conversation. I think definitely and now, very on now. So there's only so much you can learn through self development. I feel like, or through theory. I feel like in school, in primary school especially, there was a lot more like black people in my area and a lot more family around me. I feel like through play, it was just um, like everyone would do karate, or everyone would like stay after school and hang out at each other's houses and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think 
just that bit of how to build up your social skills helps you to feel more like accepted, helps you to feel more confident within yourself because you're in a circle of people around you that not only like looked like you but kind of had similar experiences. And it's kind of what you said about going from Nigeria to going to like the boys' school. Mm -hmm. It was different, like being the one of the only black kids. Shout out to Kof and shout out to Carl because they were there as well. Shout out, shout out, gang, to the yeah, come on. <laughs> Big energy, team energy. Yeah, you know, they were like, like proud of you guys when you're doing your thing. So, yeah, that was pretty bad. That was pretty bad. I think the older we get, it's the the more we start. I think around year four, or year four was like the first time I noticed. I was like, it's slightly different. Um, but like still, like I said, primary school, everyone was more so like loving and embracing and accepting of each other. It was kind of like you said about that childhood naivety, like we all just saw each other as a big group of friends and like didn't see each other as any different. What did you learn from being in solitude? What What did you learn from being in solitude versus being a good city of friend? Were there times at school where you had a lot of time to yourself? Or were there times? Secondary school, I became a lot more introverted. Yeah. A lot more introverted. I think, number one, I found music. But number two, I think the experience of going from different place to place and all my friends kind of going to the other school, kind of being the new kid again. Um, I feel like that's where I kind of found my passion, but also I felt secondary school's character building, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah, I think I became a lot more introverted. Like I used to stay in the music block quite a lot and um, just do my thing. And I think that's where I learned about myself in solitude. So music became a catharsis. But also you miss out on conversational skills of like going outside during break times or going outside during lunch times and just having that bond and just like developing those social skills and stuff. How did music change the essence of who you are? Massively. Because yeah. I know you and I'm sure for the last six months yeah. at university. I know something music is almost like it's, it's a part of your soul. It's a so part of your human being. being. It's your core essence. It's like you yeah. described it to me in past conversation that it's, it's something. The one thing that's better than sex. Yo, funny this guy. Yeah, no, I, I live. live I, I live in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I live and breathe it. And I think. Just discovering music. I used to, <laughs> ironically, year two, I used to play trombone and the instrument was bigger than me. They used to do a free. Well, like the backpack was bigger than me as well. Yeah, like the backpack <laughs> was bigger than me as well. But going into music, <laughs> yeah, I think around year eight, mm -hmm. that's when I started really getting into it and really like honing into my craft. Thing. But what was about it that made you? that spark inside of you that because it's that it's, connection what was it it's a universal language that everyone can understand i could be speaking in portuguese i could mm. be speaking in swahili mm. if you feel it you feel it and i think that was that was the beauty of music is that it could convey emotions it can convey thoughts and feelings that mm. no conversation or no words ever could you know they say a picture takes a thousand words you know with music, it was almost like music could communicate a thousand emotions, a thousand conversations that you never even like would say to a person on a regular basis. I uh, so if you could have a conversation with a person who invented music, but I have no idea who it is, I have no knowledge about that. Yeah. What would you say to Michael? The so person who played the first instrument. What was your energy? Oh, what? I love it, I love it. Energy can only be transferred, not created or destroyed. Mm -hmm. So that energy to create the music, that energy to play how you feel, what 
what are you feeling at that time? So what made you come up with the first chord? What made you come up with the first note or the first sequence? Because I smile, I don't say my like that. Mm. That was crazy. So like the origins of like communication, um, one of the origins was like oral tradition, right? Like even in African culture, we have a lot of oral tradition. And I feel like even with humming and grunting, like when did it become musical? Like when did sounds like take over sight or action? Yeah, what was your energy? Like why what sparked it all? What about yourself? What was your like calling or your purpose? Or in in terms of what? In terms of the thing you live and breathe. Man, yeah, so what we touched on in the first podcast now is definitely mm. it's definitely fitness, man. Mm. All the people all the people that go to the gym, like now this is that like, universal thing that you're talking about in music. The gym saved us. Mm. Like the amount of self confidence it gives you. Yeah. But you just the, uh, the phrase, your mirror never lies, man. Mm. Look at the mirror as a reflection of who you are, man. Yeah. And when you're owning that your physical self, man. Right. Bruh, it like it's like almost building one pie in one area of your life cascades to other areas of your life and it's crazy, man. Yeah. And going back to the main overarching theme of this podcast is how do you see yourself? How do you see yourself now is man I walk in that gym, look in the mirror, man, I just think of my favourite movie. Dark Knight Rises, bang, bang. Bang. Yeah. look good, feel the darkness. Yeah, in your eyes. Ah, don't gas me, man. Yeah. But especially with COVID nineteen now. Yeah, mask on, bro. Yeah. Ah, uh, the energy is mad in that, but yeah. When did your fitness journey begin? When I first got to university, uh, I started properly going to the gym. Were you school fit for? In high school in America, yeah, I don't mention when I went to high school in America before we bombed the university for three years in Connecticut, shout out to the Academy for yeah. having me. Yeah. Oi, 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 oi. But yeah, if you know you know. Um, yeah. yeah, scrawny man, love like shirts when you're feeling a shirt, anything. Yeah, being bangs with your eating and that's good. But only take out, like, the, <laughs> the fit, the, a lot of us weren't feeling that food, man. That's all I was saying. School goodness. Woo! I still got you cold. I was ordering Cheshire pizza every day. I tell you what, the cushion got Do you remember paninis? You got yeah. to have paninis. Paninis. Yeah, yeah. Right in the food. What? As well. The what? Paninis. At the food counter. Or oh, yeah. Oh, like yeah. The the scars. Scars. That's terrible, man. Oh, man. But yeah, but not to go off that. Very scrawny kid in high school, and mm. that's where a lot of wasn't satisfied. You know, like when you look in the mirror, you're just not. If you're not satisfied with what you're looking, of course, like as well with the fitness journey. Yeah. One thing that's very important that I learned is, of course, you have to have that. With anything, like you always, you always, you have to have that. You have to have that healthy level of self love before and always before because it doesn't matter how much muscle you bring, all of that, if you don't have that ready, that healthy relationship with yourself, man, it doesn't matter like what you see at the same time, if you know what I mean. So, like, but with that, the rewarding thing of the fitness journey is. Physical, a physical conveyance of results there and then, three months, six months, delayed gratification. And it goes back to show if you, man, it's mad, it's mad. So, what happened when I first got to university is, yeah, so I've been gym, I met a bunch of really cool friends, man, a bunch of really cool friends. Shout out to T, shout out to Jamal. Love some too many people shout, man. <laughs> <laughs> Off the top of my head, like that. 
Uh, but you, you know who you are, the gym, the gym junkies and my barbers as well. Yeah. Gaza, um, Montana, Fez, Vaz. But yeah, man, it was just very, it was very. You could see your progress. Mm, I was very. My first year, I wasn't as consistent as I wanted to be. Yeah. And second year, I went crazy. Like, I started waking up at 5 a.m. and cycling all the way from Winton to town, 20 minutes. And it was almost the best feeling in the world because the whole world was asleep, man. Wow. At that time, it's just the bones trapping and the gym's empty and you're just in the sanctuary. That's what all of us think of the gym, man. Yeah, it's a sanctuary. That's why when COVID happened, boy, ropes. Yeah, a lot of people lost that sense of routine because the gym gave them that. Especially if, like, you start your exercise, it's your first thing you do. Um, your first the physical activity being the first thing you do. Edge, you ready for alert? You're going. But back to that, in the morning, that morning feeling, man, of... You started the day off right. Started the day off right, but man, it's just like a solitude, the whole world's asleep. It's like Kevin Hart said this, you have that, you feel like you have that edge over others. Not in like a pedestal type of, type kind of way, like using other people's stepping stones, but as just getting after it, man, you're doing your own thing, you're kind of laying. But yeah, that was a dope part of it. And then, as always, if you're not mainly consistent with something, you fall off and the gym is a very good indicator because what happens, summer comes, people start partying, all of that. The FOMO comes, especially as we were talking about the identity, yeah. being built on friends earlier growing up and undoing that conditioning and learning more to be more comfortable alone. You start wondering, like, oh, I'm missing out, I'm not going to party in, but it's like, having that self-control to say okay I'm gonna do this work hard play hard yeah. but it's like so easy to let yourself go and as not to go off a tangent gym is that physical conveyance of hey there's a phrase saying your body is the physical manifestation of your will yeah so how you how you're imposing your will on reality it's your you know no boy as we talked about in the first podcast Arnold Schwarzenegger sure said your body is one thing you can't fake. Hundred percent. And I remember, <laughs> I remember the first year as well. So my uncle would take me to the gym, and he'd wake me up at like six o'clock, and it was the same. Like there were some parties and some events you miss out on, but it was that sort of feeling that you're you're working on yourself and you're getting up early. It felt like you were on your grind or like you were becoming better because mm -hmm. of that sense of discipline and that sense of sacrifice in a sense. Like it's almost respectable seeing all the early, like the regulars that would be in earlier than you and would be mm. like just doing their thing and like they'd be helpful and they show you the different workouts. And I think there's something about working out with older people. Like I couldn't lift weights when I was the scrawniest kid in the world, man. And my uncle was like some six foot H runner. We used to work out with another guy and he was um he was mm. tough that man, like some military guy. <laughs> Every time I try to lift the weights with my little scrawny arms and it would go down on my chest, I'll be like, oh yeah, I'll jump for the next rate. But they'll be like, there's no teeth breaks, bro. And I think that sort of discipline and that sort of, um, we're not going to cut you some slack mm -hmm. because we want to bring out the best in you. Mm -hmm. I think after a while, you start to internalize it yourself and it is that kind of thing. If we're linking back to identity, you tie yourself to your environment at some points or at points in your life. So I may have tied myself to like the gym or the people I went with, but then eventually when you start going by yourself, you start buying your own weights, you start getting up in the morning yourself and going for runs. So it's like you've internalized, internalized what you've learned from other people. And I think that was the, the beauty of going to the gym. And just like, I guess the beauty of having learning from other people, like you said, learning from play, 
versus learning from sure learning. for sure it comes with that as you said it's that mentorship that comes with it from learning from wiser people and yeah. that camaraderie and brotherhood and sisterhood you're seeing all these other people getting after you know when you like want to run mm. you see other people running it's just it's like, man like sometimes the competitiveness in me will be like that's it mm, that's this it. person better not speed up over me like but then it ties back into oh, like God. focusing on athletics. Athletics. Oh man. <laughs> See, with you, you had the gym, I had athletics, man. What? Stop it. You, 100 meters every year, you'd be like, ah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't okay. win that. What are you dusting? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, dusting down that track. Uh, no. Nah, it it was that sense of that. Yeah, you just get inspired by it. Or even with the gym, like you start following people that like work out heavy or you start seeing people that are lifting like mad weights that are like three times your weight. It was when they told me about ants and they said that ants can lift like one and a half times their weight. And I'm like, well, why am I start struggling to lift a 20 pound dumbbell? And it was just like, that's just sure, stuff. Sure, for sure. Yeah. You just touched on a really good point. So mm-hmm. seeing on like, it inspires you. So a lot of your mindset that a toxic mindset that you can have when you see other people doing better than you. Yeah. Seeing it as an inspiration, and I'll, I'll break this down a little bit more because one one, one thing that happened to me when I first entered the gym. Yeah. When anyone first happened to me, enter a place like the gym, is you can have that bit of insecurity, that f- that feeling of being like an outcast. It goes back to our tribal mentality. For yeah. like a primitive nature, not wanting to be outcasted from the group, not wanting to make mistakes and look like the odd one out. Mm. And you can feel that like insecurity as well. That's why you see like a lot of gyms are selling people on like confidence, being for everyone, especially my gym is the gym for everyone. Because yeah. it wants to be it wants to be inclusive because I know people that feeling when you first enter the gym is mm. man, I don't know like myself, all these people are like bigger than me, all of that. Um, I remember what if I what if I can't what if I can't put the weight back on correctly? What if I don't know how to use a machine? You know, get the big, you know the big dumbbells. Yeah, they used to have them like little <laughs> tips. So you have the little key system one, yeah. and then you'd have to pop that 20, 30 once, and it'd be like the other one is legs. That's why legs became my favorite. We used to do legs on Mondays, and I used to hate it at first because number one is brutal, and it felt like you couldn't walk up the stairs. But number two was there was the weight machine, and you know it had the resistance. Yeah. Do you know how <laughs> ridiculous it feels sometimes when, like, you see the weight like, and it's on like ninety six, and then you have to bring it down to seventy four or sixty eight to do your workout. So and, yeah, 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 it goes back to that insecurity that you can feel, and yeah. a lot of a lot of people, especially me, that's what happened. Like, mm. you feel like, damn, it feels weird. You're like, how can I see all? Yeah, this person, this could be happening to. And so if you're overweight or if you're really skinny and you want to get big. So what happened to me when I first entered the gym, I was like, this is, I'm um, tying this back to the toxic mindset. This is a two, you can have one of these two mindsets. How you yeah. can see things when you see pe- other people who are in places you want to go. Yeah. And this is what happened to me. I felt that envy in a way. Mm. And that envy was just like, oh, look, there's another person, they're already there. But it's also because now we live in this lack of patience world where we want everything instantly. Mm. And it's just like, wow, man. And it's just like, and but envy reveals your innermost desires. Mm. So what I started doing was like, saying like, the only way to counteract envy when you're feeling heavy of everyone, when you're feeling not heavy of everyone, but if you're feeling envious of what some, someone else or some or someone else has is through gratitude yeah. and gratitude is the elixir for that because envy is just negative energy completely out when yeah. you when you speak negative energy you bring more of that onto your consciousness your life is gratitude be thankful for that person go ask them questions ask see what you can learn from them so i just started yeah. approaching bodybuilders saying like what do you eat what do you do that what's the work out what do you do right yeah like and you bring that into everywhere in your life, saying, what can I learn from this person? What can I learn from this person's mistakes, their successes? How can I fast track the process for me? So you're very right about that as well, because thinking, I think that was the switch. I used to see all the hedge bodybuilders like, like 
Bro, they're ridiculous. And then I learned about body types. Hard work, Prince. And it was um, actually from a PT back home. Yeah. Shout out to Terence. Make sure you support him. Shout out, Shout out to, to Terence. Yeah. <laughs> but it was actually from Terence. And he told me about exomorphs, mm -hmm. endomorphs, and mesomorphs. And he was the first person yeah, to tell yeah. me. I how to tell me more about that. So I told him, oh, I want to be like 96 kg and have a BMI of 30 and all this business. And he told me, Right, your body type is an exomorph. So exomorph sperm carries quite quickly. They're like mm -hmm. skinny yeah, and they have a fast metabolism. Yeah. metabolism. Bodybuilders are usually endomorphs. So they have a lot of mass and it's harder for them to burn fat but easier for them to bulk up. Mesomorphs are a mix in between where if you're a mesomorph, you're more likely to have, I guess, the more athletic, like, muscular figure because you're almost capable of burning a decent amount of fat but also bulking a decent level. Mm -hmm. So when I found out that I was like an exomorph or mesomorph combination yeah. and not an endomorph, yeah. it made me stop trying to attain a unisys or a Ronnie Coleman body or yeah. a Arnold Schwarzenegger body and start looking at a, a body that's like suited me or like started looking at myself mm -hmm. and how I can make what I have the best mm -hmm. like I could be the best version of myself rather mm -hmm. than trying to outdo somebody of else course, or of course. trying to attain yeah. something that isn't attainable for me not because you're not capable but because that's just not your part mm -hmm. that's just not yeah, that's just not for you yeah. so yeah gym gym and identity is a big one I guess mm -hmm. But now, like a year now, I mean, mm. how do you see yourself now as a, a university right now? A stronger person. Yeah. A you much stronger person. person. Yeah, the spirit animal. Totally. And the spirit animal. It's, uh, <laughs> my spirit animal is a type. It used to be, I feel like, when I was in secondary school, yeah. my point to me, it felt like the ugly duckling desperate yeah. to be a swan. But I feel like now the type of strength comes from itself or internal. So a lion is strong and a lion is strength comes from its pride. Yeah. But I think I resonate with the tri tiger as well because even though like having company and having um, your audience and having your tribe is great, you can also have that internal strength from within. So it's kind of like what uh, Kano says about P's and Q's. Who? Kano. I've been listening to much of the music. Oh, but, uh, but, uh, but I just know from Top Boy, obviously. Yeah. What's it? Is that yeah. Sully? Yeah, Sully. Yeah, Sully. Yeah, that's Sully. Uh, that's right. that's it. Even on yeah. Even though my own twos, that's the difference between me and you. And that's how I see like a tiger. It's like, even on its ones. Like, even if it's by itself in the wild, like, it's still has its own strength and still has its own capability and that's not to say you don't need people because it's always great to have people but having that internal strength within yourself to get whatever you need to get done done without external motivation i think that's inspiring to me so i feel like that's why the time that became my spirit animal mm -hmm. what about yourself i said pain already pain yeah, yeah. But like in terms of animal um It's got to be, I think it's got to be more wolf now, because yeah. wolf is very symbolic. I think I'm not a lot of masculine men right now, is that it's a balance of having, so I've said I'm big fat. Mm. I, can you delve more into that? Yeah, it's a, yeah, I'm introvert. Yeah. They gain their energy for probably more creative pursuits and just by being more to themselves. And extroverts, they gain more of their energy for association with other people and they find more comfort in the group. Yeah. I don't have too much more knowledge to dive on about each one and their personality breakdowns. And ambivert is in the middle. Mm. They have introverted and extroverted qualities, 
So I'd say, ambiverse, gain the energy from being surrounded by like-minded individuals or other people in general, but they have to go charge up like a battery. Mm. So I can connect with that. I think they have to, they have to get back and tap into the things they love by themselves because after a while, the battery gets overcharged from being around too many yeah. other batteries. Hundreds. It's just like, it's just like an iPhone. Yeah. It dies eventually if you use it too much. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta recharge. You gotta recharge. Sometimes you gotta like, go into your own cave and like, find yourself for a little bit and then go back up. Yeah, man. But also just having like, it's a big quote. What's it saying? It's, I forgot who's, which author it's by, but it says, Something along the lines of the majority of man's problems is their inability to sit in a room by themselves. So that idea of facing the silence of facing yourself. And mm. it's easier said than done, man. A lot of the time, a lot of people at our age is, mm. we always want to socialise with other people and do other things with other people, but it's always important to have this time for yourself, man, whether you're meditating, you're reading, you're writing, you're doing creative pursuits, so. I think that's a big one, especially like, coming towards the end of university. It's almost like you've made so many great friends and great connections and they're still going to be there. But yeah. it's almost like, I always feel like things have come full circle again in some yeah. senses. So some aspects, you know, things I'm passionate about, like I feel like a tiger and I feel like I um, don't need motivation to do the things I love. Like in other senses, it's like social. It's like your identity, your, your sense of well-being and happiness can be tied to your friends mm -hmm. again at times and I think yeah just with university and everyone going home like almost that sense of that camaraderie or that sense of like being a part of a team being a part of something mm -hmm. bigger than yourself and like just having those connections mm -hmm. I think that's like invaluable mm -hmm. and um, that's definitely something that I'm coming to terms with now with like people moving out or with like people graduating and going to live their lives. Like, I know they're still gonna be there, mm -hmm. but it's almost that sense of, right, I've got to by myself and learn how to manage on my own again. Or make, or make those new connections. Of course, man, yeah, of yeah. course. But it's just like, yeah, it's so important to have ability to be comfortable with that, man. Mm. Really is. Um, I think it's a transitionary period every time. Like mm -hmm. primary school, you got the last day of primary school, and everyone's signing each other. Of course, class. man, because we're yeah. so we're so conditioned just mm -hmm. from our upbringing, always being with other people, humans being social animals. Hundred percent. To always be relying on the group, and when you were outcasted by the group, or when the group left, and you're on your own, that's why you have to be for yourself that's what mm. it's like the wolf has to be like for me it's, it has to be my spirit animal because the wolf is comfortable in, in packs but it's also man it can hunt alone man I have to yeah because it's like you said it with that the cognitive dissonance you feel mm. whether you're leaving at the end of each graduation at school it's like oh we're doing this again we can do this and then you got prom yeah then you got uh leavers and then now you've got like graduation and we just like jeez yeah Twenty banks of prom you know the what it's come on you were ashamed to see i was flexing i used to have my little what my uh, my one over my one cup uh, i was flexing in that prom suit boy the little penguin suit with the purple uh, shirt uh, why were you rocking Fresh bow tie, man. My glasses. Yeah. Oh. It was cold, man, but you know the prom mm. music? All of that. Dead ones. Yeah. All of the dead bees there. But. Yeah. Yeah, man. High school was fun. I had a lot of great memories from yeah. Connecticut. I met a lot of great people. Mm. Yeah, man. Good fun. Yeah, yeah. So, how, are you excited about the future? Hmm. Mm. What do you gotta think, man? Yeah, gotta be. What do you think is in store for your personal growth as a person? Like, how do you think your identity is gonna change man. in the working world or in the the hustling world? Like, 
you being on your purpose and pouring yourselves into your passions. Like, yeah, what's next for Man, I think it's really just, yeah, yeah, embodying that king mindset that that wolf, that wolf mentality, man, being comfortable and learning that. Mm. Leveraging your social assets, that's one of the big things about this energy podcast I'm so happy to start with. I can give back to people that have put me on in business as well, that help me with networking opportunities that have helped me grow as a person, but also teach at the same time as I learn, because there's a quote by a philosopher called Seneca saying, yeah. men learn as they teach. Okay. And you learn, you also, you're learning twice as you teach. Mm -hmm. So as I'm gaining experiences, something I can teach, something I can share with other people is very important. Knowledge that hasn't shared is dead. Yeah. And that's a good quote. Knowledge that isn't shared is dead. Yeah. And you don't know you don't have the power of a message for someone on their journey in their life. Because I'm not your guru. Mm. I'm just a student of life, man. I'm learning yes. as I'm going. Yeah. I'm not your Elon Musk yet. I'm not your... <laughs> I'm still in university, but... Man, I just mean gotta it. give back. Yeah. Just gotta give back and... It's really about empowering other people through authentic storytelling. That's why I think the Energy Podcast yeah. is conceptualised right now into. Mm -hmm. And yeah, man, I'm just looking forward to empowering other people, yeah. being more comfortable in my black essence after all the things that have gone on with Black Lives Matter in America, because we felt that with. And the rapes in Nigeria mm. and the hunger in Yemen. Yeah. The world is like starving right now. And yeah. you felt this global consciousness of man, as well as most men, injustice is just getting filmed now. It's been happening. Mm. So it's just, but you feel it on another level in social media. Yeah. Because that's where you've got to order your time on it sometimes. Mm. Easier said than done. And because of the dopamine addiction, you'll have to. You. Yeah, back to you feel that. You feel that energy, man. Like we all felt, especially as me and you, as two black men, mm. with what was going on in Black Lives Matter in America and George Floyd. Yeah. You felt that in your soul, didn't you? Definitely. I felt yes. that in my soul, man. Mm. And it goes, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say it was um, a post I saw actually on social media, ironically, but it was it said George Floyd wasn't a wake up call. Y'all have just been hitting the snooze button Ooh. for years. Wow. And that's how I felt. Wow. I felt like I'm not glad, but I feel like it sparked a conversation, it sparked a movement again for a resurgence that was very much needed. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, as a black man, mm -hmm. and having, sounds cliche, but the black experience growing up, mm -hmm. it was nothing new to see, just to see on that scale. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like I said, the great thing was that it sparked a conversation and it sparked an action that was definitely needed. But I feel like, I guess you can connect in the same way that it's just being filmed. It's not anything new. Mm. What do you think is next to change yeah. the conversation from it being purely reactionary rioting? No rioting, but protesting. And then we go back, we forget, we move on with our lives. Changing. It's crazy, man, because politics is so convoluted. That's why yeah. there's so much research that I have to do into like get delving into understanding the nuances of it. Hundred percent. Because like it's been tied into capitalism, a bunch of other different subjects. Yeah. I feel like. Could you repeat the question for me? 
You know how every time there's injustice, a mm, black man gets stabbed, a black man gets shot, especially in America. Yeah. How do we change it from something that's reactionary, we as black people, to something that's strategic, to something that's organized, to something that will bring some systematic change? Because something right now is, yeah, images yes. and betrayal. So, what did you say? Images, images and betrayal. So, I think we delved on this in a previous conversation yeah. about images being tied to self esteem. So, the way we see ourselves, one of the reasons why George Floyd was painful to look at and painful to watch was seeing yourself in the victim mindset. It's not necessarily empowering. And that's, that's no fault of him. him. That's no fault of him at all. But in terms of the media and the our portrayal as um, subservient, it almost becomes a self esteem and oppressive. Yeah, so true. And I feel like definitely images and self esteem, like seeing people that look like you. So, kind of linked into primary school. Yeah. Like Garden Primary, seeing like people that look like you, mm. um, or seeing role models older than you achieving things that you wanted to achieve. But seeing strong figures and strong characteristics that you can internalize within yourself, I think that's definitely one. I believe as well, conversation and the social aspect of us being stronger than stronger together. We get reactionary when we feel like we're oppressed, and we get reactionary when we feel mm -hmm. like we're down, and we riot and we try to tear down um, the system. Mm -hmm. Maybe far fetched, but building our own, building our own economy, and like having that self, that self alliance again, black 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 because then black you don't have to have any accountability to another demographic or another person mm -hmm. for your sense of self worth mm -hmm. and your sense of identity. If you've got your own, whether it's assets, whether it's esteem, whether it's confidence, or yeah, whether it's just good group of people around you, a good environment, then yeah, you'll no longer have to feel like you need to be validated by someone or something else. So not just as a black man, but as an individual. So yeah. But how do you find how do you get the youth to connect to leaders of those figures? Because right now the youth are looking up to people like rappers so they're doing music their Percocets and their leans and music. So Images control self esteem. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of older generations are so against the portrayal of new genres. So, say, for example, when hip hop came about, yeah. and you had the soul vibe, and mm -hmm. said, Oh, it will never last, and that's the most dominant genre. Yeah. And it happens every time. So, they're like, Oh, it's too harsh, or the portrayal is too violent, or it's degrading our women. And it's because the images obviously influence the next generation, but also the next generation are just talking about how they feel and how they experience. So if we talk about UK music, for example, so you had UK hip hop, you had UK garage, mm -hmm. you had grime, got a bit harder, gritty, grammar, grammy, hence the word grime. And then now you have UK drill, and it's even harder, harder even, and even more like, Heritage oh, history, history right now. I didn't know any of this. Oh, but yeah, but like for instance, over time it's almost like the experience becomes like more masculine in a sense, or the experience becomes like harder, and uh, I guess the older generations find it difficult to connect with what the youth are experiencing because they're at different parts in their lives. Mm -hmm. So where it may resonate with the hip hops and the hip hop and the clothing and uh, the music may resonate with a younger audience. Some people outgrow it and some people just can't connect with that experience. So you ask your great uncle that grew up in soul music what he thinks about UK drill. He may say it slaps, but he may not be able to. <laughs> no, he may be like, come on, man. We, we can adore the floor. <laughs> There's a couple of granddads that could have been passing past a dirty little drone. But he may say it's that. That's crazy and buzzing. I'm telling you, he's right. I'm the look, he's right. Oh, he's right. Go to an old age pension at home and pass a bit of my own team. Ask me if I'm like, what job you came and start busting. Yo, man. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 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 so, so, yeah, yeah. Bro. <laughs> uh, but one, definitely. Shout out to the One Nation. Oh, um, I And I won. But yeah, now to kind of get back on to answering your question. Oh, okay. I, I feel like. Yeah, yeah continue. <laughs> I feel like self-esteem and I feel like um, conversation between generations mm. conversation between generations but also the older we get especially now graduating I bet in two or three years we'll be a bit detached from like the music in the clubs yeah. like so it's like when you're out in first year, you're out every day and you're partying and you know all your tunes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when you get to third year or you get to final year, it's almost like, oh, um, who's this artist? Or this ain't really um, like my sort of vibe. Or like, you remember this old band? And then you were like, no, that came out five years ago. So it's that sense of keeping that connection between the older generation and the younger generation, which is the beauty of like sampled music. Yeah. Like the reinvention, say like Pop Smoke's album. Yeah. Like, you know, we love that um, Goye Homie tune. And like, I to us, it, I'll man. tell you. Many men. And like, to us, many, it's like the anthem of the world. You go back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to yeah. the, like the older generation, you yeah. know, they've had many men 57. And that's the beauty of like sampling and the beauty of like DJing is that yeah you can kind of almost connect both generations together through the power of music I guess mm. yeah and you say well, what do you think when we get older what are we playing at our wedding you know for music are we bumping pop smoke and drill yeah no I don't know I don't know I might, I might sneak in a little bit of joy to see a little bit of drink or whatever but uh, can you imagine that uh, no for the things money can't buy mm. and it's also being grounded so some of the things money can't buy character time family yeah knowledge well it depends on the clothes you can learn about like that's general knowledge but like specific knowledge from people's experiences yeah some of those things but also, silver spoon can't buy the wisdom or hard as that. Same quote from the Mad. first podcast. Mm. Mm. Mad. Yeah. But yeah, let me think about this a bit more. I think happiness is also cultivating an appreciation for the present. Mm. Because one thing Viktor Frankl said Viktor Frankl is a, his story is a remarkable man. And he is. He was a psychiatrist who got imprisoned in a concentration camp during the Second World War. Yeah. So he was carrying out, um, he usually treated people with trauma, but he ended up 
living experiences of your most unimaginable experiences. You yeah. had to be in the concentration camps and the Second World War where what's the name of the campos, the sergeants and not sergeants, the campos were these I think they were Jewish prisoners who were told by the Nazis to to be leaders, to be enforcers yeah. of the weaker Jewish people in the camp. And then you had obviously the brutalization of by these Nazi leaders as well in the camps. So the, some of the experiences he he went through, he talks about witnessing that every day and not knowing if it'll be you next. It's almost that like what you think of it like a war movie as well. Mm. Where mortars are just going off everywhere like jarhead, but it's like this is like literally on like another unimaginable level. Yeah. That they don't know where the next meal's coming to get do you get fed a speck a speck of bread a speck of bread like tiny the sounds of a 50p coin mm. and to tie this he said that the people who survived in the camps whether it was for three years or five years however long they were imprisoned were the people who when all of their freedom had been stripped, when they had been dehumanized on another level, when they had been seen as subhuman, because Jews were seen as these people that weren't even human mm. by back then. Stripped of everything, you're stripped of your dignity, of your respect, of your morals, your family members are again, again kicked on, you've lost everything, you have no hope. But in that moment, the one thing you have that is so profound, so powerful is that no one can take from you. It's yeah. your attitude to your circumstances. Mm. It's that is having hope at the lap at the there will be an end to the darkness that you're facing. There will be you will see your family members again. If your family members were all gone. You will live for them, you'll provide for them if you get out. And he said that the people who survived were the people who held on to their spirit. Mm. The people who, no matter how much death and trauma they witnessed and how much psychological damage they went through, they held on to the one thing no one could strip them of. And that was the attitude and the spirit and the inner strength. I like that. So to tie that back to happiness is it's internal with everything going on in the external world it's so easy to feel like you're out of control but the only thing you can control is your thoughts, your words, your actions you can't control other people, their behaviours are so easy to think like oh they should do this, they should everyone should do that Yeah, but or something as simple as, oh, why is there traffic today? Why is it raining today? So we, get, we, can, so we can easily get in those thought loops, but you're focusing on the external world. And that's why when you study philosophy and Marcus Aurelius, yeah. and those stoic men of principle, you learn to focus on what you can control, well, not to focus on what you can't control. When you become more, you will grow with your more kind of stillness within you. And Marcus Aurelius says to retreat into yourself as well. It goes back to our introvert side. I always like to yeah. anyone who wants to charge up, retreat into yourself, be comfortable in solitude. Yeah. And no one sometimes, yeah, I'm not gonna listen to music today, or sometimes yeah. I'm just gonna go for a walk or I'm leave my phone in my house or not everything has to be recorded for social media. Yeah. Things like that. Just Tapping into your, your inner self, your inner G. The energy. energy. I like that. I was going to say in closing, actually, one of the quotes I see 
or one of the clo quotes that I saw from just a little app that I have on my phone. It's a little motivation app. But one of the quotes I saw today was self love and self respect comes from within. That's why it has self at the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a perfect way to almost summarize the conversation today. Even though I'm really glad to get into a lot, lot more There's conversations. A mad, conversation. Honestly, mad. honestly, I'm ready to go again. But definitely, I feel like yeah, I'm that will be. Yeah, I think to like yeah, almost to close up this episode, just to elaborate on that quote about self love, self respect, and like self identity coming from within, and that is why there's self at the beginning of it. It just communicates that well, almost what you were saying, like no matter what external resources may come your way, almost that sense of stoicism. Mm -hmm. Like we have a saying, <laughs> a saying in Jamaica. We run things, things the wrong way. Ah, uh, that's that's it. Exactly it. It's like no matter what happens around me, no matter what foolishness makes you run me. Bless up, bro. <laughs> all the same people when it comes to coming. Bless up, bro. Black wow. power, man. The black ownership, black excellence. Yeah. Hundred percent. People want to be held down. Never. And that's Nigeria, man. 